Good morning and welcome to the talent management session hosted by Kronos. My name is Mert Skizelbosch. I'm the regional sales exec for Kronos in the greater Sacramento area. And the topic we're going to talk about today is the management of multi-generational workforce. I think this is the first time in decades, if not ever, that we have five very distinct groups of people that make up our colleagues and friends in, in the various departments. And how do we get the workforce not only to work together, but have high levels of employee satisfaction and productivity? So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to take maybe three minutes and, and introduce who Kronos is, and you'll understand why Kronos uh, is hosting this session. And then I'll introduce the, the panel that you're really here to, to hear from, and we'll get into the discussion. The discussion will be about 30 minutes, and following that, we'll open it up, and we'll love for you folks to ask questions, share your reactions and experiences in your particular departments that we can all learn from. So if all that makes sense, uh, we'll get started. So Kronos is, is a workforce slash uh, human capital management company. Been around for 37 years. Uh, we do about $1.3 billion in software. And if you believe people like Gartner and IDC, we're number one uh, from a revenue and market share perspective, uh, automating, automating uh, employees and workforces in all, all segments of the market, including public sector. Um, within public sector, here in, in the greater Sacramento area, uh, our biggest clients, Kronos clients, are Department of Corrections, uh, California Highway Patrol. Uh, we have Parks and Recreation, uh, CalPERS, and there's a few that are coming on board as we speak. And what we do for each of these departments is automate their workforce. What does that mean? It takes everything from hiring an employee all the way to retiring and everything in between. So timekeeping, leave accounting, uh, things such as activities management, uh, projects and grants tracking, right? scheduling. Uh, we also have HR solution. Those are the kind of thing that Kronos does. Uh, the beauty of, of, of the solution like Kronos is a lot of times people get energized about a solution and then it takes 12 to 18 months to purchase it through our uh, rigorous RFP process. Um, exactly, we've all experienced that. Uh, the good news is that Department of General Services in the state has brought us on board, Kronos, and has vetted us out. We meet all their terms and conditions, <coughs> and we're part of the software license program. So you can purchase Kronos software and Kronos services, and, and this is no exaggeration, in less than two weeks. And I have our, 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 our friends from Parks and Rec who will who will hopefully back me up that from the time that they decided to purchase Kronos to the time that they brought us on board um, as far as issuing a purchase order, et cetera, was two weeks or less. So it's a long ways from 12 to 18 months. Okay, I've done my bit about advertising Kronos. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me segue into introducing this, this beautiful panel here. So I'm gonna start with Chris Rojas. Chris is Deputy Director of Admin for Caltrans. Uh, Department of Transportation. Next to Chris is Paul Smith, Deputy Director of IT for Department of Corrections, a couple of small departments. Um, <laughs> next to uh, Paul is Rob Calderon, who's the Chief for the Office of Personnel Services at Corrections. And last but not least, the young man is Joe Panora, who was the uh, AIO for Corrections until about a year ago uh, when he moved into a consulting role and now does mentoring for up-and-coming talent for many different departments. Drinks a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, uh, I'm going to initiate and, and, and ask a few questions. Um, and, I, and as we do, we'll slide, go through some of these slides and you can read it, I'm not gonna cover it. But I wanna start with you, Chris. In Caltrans, you've been there for, for a few years, You've seen the evolution of, of the incoming folks and then the, the mix and the demographic of, of your employee base. Help us understand uh, what that's been like, not only from a skills perspective, but also from attitudes. What are employees looking for 
in, in, in their jobs? Uh, how are the prior generations working with current generations? Thank you, Mertz. Can everybody hear me okay? So uh, when Mertz first asked me to be on his panel, I was a little hesitant, but then I realized I would be representing the younger generations, so I agreed <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Just a little joke. Um, I, I am in my 30th year of civil service, and it's, it's flown by rather quickly. Uh, I used to be uh, one of the younger people in my office, and uh, now I'm not. <laughs> and don't ask me any questions about that. Um, we do have, uh, Caltrans has almost 20,000 employees um, uh, in our uh, workforce and um, you know we've all been hearing about the silver tsunami, right? Um, the, the term used for our aging workforce. Uh, some of us um, might be planning our own exit pretty soon. Um, some of us on the panel might be planning our own exit pretty soon. Um, <laughs> But I have to say, um, we've been worrying about this for years, and we've been talking about it for years. I think we're actually in it right now. We're in our tsunami phase. Um, I just, these are gross generalizations. You know, when we talk about generations, we, we like to segment them and say, these people are like this, and these people are like this, and these people are like this. I am very aware that that's not the case. These are just, uh, generalizations for purposes of discussion. I know I don't necessarily fit neatly into my box, but I, I want to talk mm -hmm. about what we have at Caltrans, um, what we're calling the traditionalist uh, generation, those born uh, before 1945. We've still got a few hanging on uh, at work. Um, we've got folks that are so engaged at work that they're 92 and they're still in the workforce. Um, they come from a different generation, obviously. They, um, they, they, um, they were around during the Second World War. Uh, they they um, experienced rationing, maybe. A completely different set of rules for them. Um, what we have the most of at Caltrans is uh, what we call our baby boomers. And of course, those are the folks born uh, right after the World War II, up through 1964. They have certain, um, things in their, their culture that they uh, prefer, like jo they are very much into job security. Um, they uh, are excellent employees in the sense that they will do what they're asked to do for their, uh, by their employer. Um, they, they're not the kind that will say that's not in my duty statement. Um, they prefer uh, telephone contact versus uh, emails um, or social media. Then um, Generation X, uh, which I'm partial to, um, I think Generation X is, is largely forgotten, um, but I really think that Generation X is the bridge that will help our baby boomers understand the millennials. So people need us in the workforce because we can act as translators for folks. Um, here we say that our attitude towards technology, we're digital immigrants, um, and that means um, I like to say uh, we're ESL, electronics, as our second language. So we're not, uh, we're not perfectly fluent, but, but we're almost there. Um, and then uh, Generation X, this identifies that we have portfolio careers, which means we might have several part-time jobs doing things we like um, and not necessarily bound to one employer. Uh, but I think that the newest generation uh, that's coming into the workforce and po probably um, one of the the biggest, uh, it's gonna be a really big workforce when they all uh, decide to, to start working. Um, <laughs> no, I love, I love millennials, I really do. Um, but they've been, they, they've been born into the digital er era. They're, they're completely fluent in IT. They don't wanna talk on the phone. They wanna either text you or um, contact you through social media. You know, we were trying to hire a student assistant a few months ago who wasn't returning our phone calls, we wanted to offer him a job. You know how we got a hold of him? We texted him, finally he, he answered his text, just not his, his voicemail, so maybe that was a red flag, I don't know. Anyway, um, I don't know if I answered your question, Mertz, but. Um, so they are changing, right? They are changing, um, and let me, let me tell you a little bit of what's going on. Am I going backwards? You're going backwards. Okay. There you go. Um, let me get you to some interesting data. So our retirements, um, 
These are our retirements over the last five years at Caltrans. The number's at 651 as of last year. Um, and you might think these numbers are pretty uh, consistent, but what you need to realize is our workforce has been going down. So these are not consistent numbers in terms, it's not a linear um, reduction because we actually have a smaller workforce. So actually the retirements are impacting us greater than ever. And as far as our department, our age profile, we've got over 55% uh, that are actually um, ready to, not ready to retire, but over 50, so eligible to retire. Um, and then as far as our managers and supervisors, this is the scary part, almost 70% are, are uh, eligible to retire. And we're seeing it. I mean, um, here's a real quick count of our um, MSP and CEA exams. These are our <laughs> higher level examinations. Um, in 2014, we had 22 um, CEA exams. Uh, in 2016, we did 29, which is a significant increase. And then, of course, our MSP exams, you can see we had 46 in 2014. Two years later, we're at 65. So our exams office is keeping super busy trying to keep up with all this turnover. Um, it's posing significant um, significant issues for the state as, employ as an employer, and I think um, what we need to be cognizant of is that we have uh, employees that are driven by different things and different interests, and um, I don't think we can be that employer anymore that says, you will do this, and this is how it's going to be, and it's going to be 8 to 5, and you get a 15-minute break in the morning. I don't think that's going to work much longer. I'm s I hope that's not heresy, but I do think that we need to start looking at uh, being more flexible as an employer, or we're going to be out of luck in terms of hiring uh, new folks on board. Makes sense. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Paul, are we making a big deal out of all these alphabet soup, Generation X, Z, et cetera? What do you see at Corrections? So, um, no, culture is valid, right? Culture is valid. And when you try to merge cultures, there's gonna be like a confluence of a river. There's gonna be places in which it's gonna be dangerous, there's gonna be places which you can take advantage of. What is unique about this time is that we're about to have two things occur. Um, one, the, with the great tsunami is real. Um, there's a great story of a little girl that was in uh, Indonesia, and she was sitting on a beach during the great tsunami that killed so many people. And she was standing there as everybody was enjoying the beach, but the water started to go out in a dramatic way. And everybody's standing there going, gee, I wonder what that is, I wonder what that is. And this young girl said, it's a tsunami. She had just learned it in class, right? And then she backed it up by looking it up. And then she said, tsunami, tsunami, and, and she saved everybody on that beach. It was one of the only places in which people were actually saved. So we're dealing with a silver tsunami, and I'm telling you, the water's going out. I'm looking you right in the eye and telling you the water's going out. I'm one of them. I'm out in four months. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> and so my inoculation to, to the millennials was I worked in the game industry. I used to work for Ubisoft. I made all the Tom Clancy games. And um, here's the deal. Uh, millennials really want to have an impact on the universe. Millennials don't want a work-life balance. Millennials want a work-life hybrid. If any of you have millennials who work for you now, I bet you anything you get texts at 1 o'clock in the morning, because I do, right? Millennials, this is a real thing, and we've got this cultural thing that's going on where Gen Xers are saying, no, man, I work 8 to 5. Right? And you've got baby boomers who are saying, um, that's great, you're really creative, come on in and sit in that cubicle and shut up. <laughs> okay? We've got all this stuff going on, but here's the advantage, right? Just like America has such a great uh, diversity of ideas and, and that friction between the different cultures, that leads to the innovation like we've never seen before. We've got certain things that are going on, right? So who has one of these in their hand? Right now? Nobody. <laughs> Everybody. And if you, if, if you were to choose one tool that you would define a millennial by, what would it be? A mobile phone. So why do we do paper apps? Why do we do websites? Why don't we create apps that tell kids 
what jobs are available. They don't want to go sift through all the data like we're used to doing. They want to have something that preemptively tells them, hey, look, you took the, the administrator three job or the SSA job, and here are the five that are within the five miles of your home or 10 miles of your home. Or based upon your resume, uh, this, these are the five best matches that you should probably apply for. And as an employer, I should probably be able to have that pushed to me. If they're going to take a test online and they're going to fill out all the application stuff on the, on the test, why do I have a cert unit? No offense to people in the suit, the cert unit. <laughs> but why do I have one? If they pass the test, that resume and everything should be put on a site that I can, or a location that I can go look up <coughs> and choose the seven people that I want to interview. Why does it take seven months to hire somebody? So here's the deal. We could change, or we could have change forced upon us. I will leave you this thing with the millennials. Millennials, and you, most of you are government employees, right? How hard is it to hire highly technical or skilled people off the street? Very. Why? From who? Pays better, the whole nine yards. Millennials is the first group in 30 years who do not put money at the top of the pay scale, at the top of the job list. They put impact on society. Who has more impact on society than you? I do corrections. We have 180,000 souls that we're charged with to try to get them. Because listen, they, they may be an inmate today, they're going to be your neighbor tomorrow. What better type of impact is that? So you can start doing it. And if we're not worried about pay, we're worried about impact on the universe, we're aligned with them. But we're not going to be aligned with them if we force them to do a paper app or force them to call back. Texting should be just fine. And people who are in the HR space, millennials work 24 hours a day. We need to figure that out, OK? Cubicles. Why do we have cubicles, everybody? To hold our landline phone and our Happy Meal toys. <laughs> right? To prove that we're cool. We have to start thinking in a different way. So, yes, I think it's real. And I think that actually today is one of those confluences in time that we could truly take advantage of. Thank you. So, Rob, if it is real, does technology help, hurt? What are you doing that addresses some of these items we've been talking about. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, but I'm actually, I've always wanted to work in personnel, but I'm actually the chief of office, peace officer selection, so personnel was my goal, but yeah, so focusing on the peace officer aspect and then CDCR as a whole. I mean, obviously we have over 60,000 employees. That's a mix of custody and non-custody, and the challenges we face in the recruitment area, which is what I'm partly charged with, it, it's immeasurable right now. Uh, anyone turn on the news and not see a story about law enforcement in, in some kind of light, usually of the negative aspect. So when you're, you're looking at ways to get people to be interested that tell them that prison's fun, you're gonna have a good time, <laughs> it can be a little challenging as you can imagine. And that's with any law enforcement job. These are, st this is across the nation, state troopers, local law enforcement, um, uh, county. Um, so. One of the issues we had to do was recognize who our target audience was and who, our, who we were trying to, to get. And obviously we've talked a, a little bit about the millennials and how we get their interest. Um, recognizing that they are so technologically savvy that we had to grow with the times and look at different methods of reaching out to these people. And, and the panel members have listed a number of methods already. Um, I did want to give some examples of the current methods that we uh, looked at through um, studies and through uh, uh, information um, research that have proved that these could or will be successful. Some of those are an aggressive nationwide iHeart radio campaign. You may most listen to iHeart or Pandora or something like that. Um, others are uh, regular Facebook live events that are site specific. So we actually do a live Facebook event, um, Facebook live event at a graduation for correctional officers at the physical fitness training area. So some of the other methods that, that we're trying to utilize, and this is for, um, not only, I mean, uh, you look at the millennials, but we are so big that we do have to recruit um, all generations just based on that 60,000 number. So 
one of the thought processes that go goes with that is the fact that if we make the job easier through technology and train um, uh, the other generations on this, it, it actually is drawing them in more when they see how easy it is to click and have a drop down box versus, you know, ch uh, chisel and tablet or whatever the case may be. That there's a lot of advantages um, to that technological advancement. Um, we're also modernizing the application process that was spoke of. We're attempting for, at least for the peace officer application process to be completely online. Um, we're also sending them uh, text messages to inform them of important dates uh, for various stages in the background process. So if we can text them and remind them, because the first thing we do is obviously give them a letter that states all the little things they're supposed to do, right? Do they read it? No, <laughs> they don't read it at all. But if I send them a text, they're like, oh yeah, thanks, be right there to that, that appointment or whatever the case may be. So we've had to evolve with that, and, and we're in the process of that with my unit right now, or my program that I'm over. Um, so modernizing the application process, text uh, message reminders, and also sending the right message. Um, as Paul said, the goal is to uh, have the individual realize that they, they make an impact. Everyone wants good pay and good benefits. And we know the private sector, sometimes the pay is better, usually, but the benefits are not. We were beating this message into the ground with corrections for a while, saying, hey, come make 70 grand, you know, you just got to work in prison, it's fine. <laughs> so we had to flip that, and we're in the process of doing that, of saying exactly like Paul said, that um, these inmates right now will be released from prison. And if we don't get their mind right or the right programs, rehabilitated programs, um, they're going to be your neighbors, and they're going to commit more offenses, and we don't want that. We don't need the business. There's plenty. Um, so our thought process is with their mindset, the millennials, is that we give them a job where they can truly make an impact in someone's life. And that's through either rehabilitative programs or whatever other uh, type of services we're offering that individual. So when they come out and they are your neighbor, they're a neighbor, you know, not a criminal. So that's our goal. Um, so currently, uh, we're reviewing all these processes and we should have some good data pretty soon. Uh, on how successful that is with the challenges of the 50% uh, reduction in application rates. So it is very challenging, um, but we're up to it and using technology to further our, uh, our needs and goals is a key part of that, so. Thank you, Rob.